Today is the day the Lord has made, so we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen and amen. Uh, I'm just going to be honest with you right now. Um, I'm fitting to do some business here. We got a lot of work to cover today. We got an important passage today, and, I, and I'm willing to bet in a, in a congregation this size with as growing as we are, um, I'm going to disappoint somebody today, but that's okay. I'm not here um, to do anything other than bring glory to God, so he's the one I want to make sure that I make satisfied here today. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And so I'm just going to head and just say it. Like we're, we're, we're doing a sermon series on the spiritual gifts. We're calling it a church empowered. We're looking at spiritual gifts, their role at the church. We got a, an important passage today that comes with a lot of healthy and sometimes not so healthy debates. And so we're just going to dive right into it. I hope you came hungry for the word today because that's what you're going to get. Thank you. All right, somebody. All right, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to look at verses 4 to 11 today. And then as you turn in there, if you are new, this is a, uh, a sermon. We're, we're just going to be rich in the Word today. Um, I'm going to move fast, so hopefully your pens are sharp. Take some good notes if you want. Put your seatbelt on. We're not slowing down. We're going to get going, see what God says, see if we can continue to be the church that God is calling us to be. So as you uh, are turning there, maybe you're wondering, what are we even talking about? What is a spiritual gift? So here's our working definition for this sermon series. A spiritual gift is a supernaturally empowered ability. This is important. Supernaturally empowered ability. It may not be supernatural in and of itself. We're going to talk about that in a moment, but it's supernaturally empowered ability empowered by the Holy Spirit given to each Christian Every Christian who has placed their faith in Jesus who died on the cross for them and rose from the grave. To every Christian, if you are a Christian who believes the gospel, the Holy Spirit has given you a gift by the will of the Holy Spirit. He's decided which gift you get. You don't decide, he decides. And he's given these gifts to believers to unite us and to fully equip us to live out our mission. That's why we're studying this. That's why... Um, I think it's so important for a church like us as we're growing and there's, there's many new faces who are now part of our family. We're so thankful. But we want to be the church that God's called us to be. We want to do what God's called us to do. And one of the ways we do that is by using our spiritual gifts. So the reason we are preaching through this, again, is with our growing church and with the increasingly brokenness of the world around us, the church needs to be strong. The church needs to be empowered, and the church needs to be doing something. And we only can do something by the power and strength of the Holy Spirit as he works in among us. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 to 11. Would you hear the word of the Lord? Paul writes to the Corinthians, and he says this. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the Spirit through utterances of wisdom, to another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between the spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are, empo all these are empowered by the one and same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Amen. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Let's get to work. Let's pray. Father in heaven, our prayer during this series is that by the power of the Spirit, you'd give us the heart to receive, the mind to understand, and the will to respond to your truth today. And it's in the name of, of our Lord Jesus that we pray these things. And everyone said, amen and amen. If I could give you one overarching idea for today. One main theme for today, it would be this. The spiritual gifts are a critical way the Holy Spirit empowers you to be part of the good work that he is doing 
at Peace Church. The spiritual gifts are a critical way the Holy Spirit empowers you to be part of the good work that he is doing at Peace Church. Let's just be honest with, the, with ourselves right now. I think there are many people in here who would be completely fine if I skipped over everything in this passage and just got right to tongues and prophecy, right? Because that's the controversy. That's what we want to know about. Just get to tongues, pastor. Well, the Bible gives us more than just a teaching on tongues. So we're going to spend time looking at what the Bible says about gifts. And yes, we will get to prophecy and tongues in a few moments. But I think it's important to start where we have been, with the, just walking through our passage. If you weren't here last week, man, I'm going to really encourage you to go back and listen to last week's message. It might help bring more context to this message. But let's go back to verse 4, 5, and 6. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all and everyone. So important things that we need to know about these verses that, that the Apostle Paul is telling the Corinthians, and I believe that the Holy Spirit is still, still telling us, is first thing would be this. The gifts are a display of the diversity and unity within the Trinity. We talked about the Trinity last week, three in one. And if you see here, it's, it's, I don't know how we can get away from Paul using some Trinitarian language here. He talks about the same spirits clearly referring to the Holy Spirit. There rise, um, he talks about the same Lord. That's a, that's a title used almost exclusively for Jesus in the New Testament. He talks about God. In the New Testament, I think we see this as a shorthand way to speak of the Father. So as I said, um, we spoke a little bit on this last week. It's, it, Paul is clearly referring to the Trinity here, how there's diversity and unity, that, that within the church, there's so much variety, but yet we are unified because the Holy Spirit is the one who empowers this all. Second thing I think we see in this passage is that the gifts have variety in form and function. This is an extremely important point for us to hear. Hear me on this. Nowhere in the Bible do we see a single exhaustive list of the spiritual gifts. And so that leads us to believe that even when you put the different lists together, and there's like, there's, there's like four different lists that the Bible gives, even when you put those together, that doesn't lead us to think that that, that entire list is exhaustive. There's many, many ways the Spirit works through a church. Maybe that's listed in the Bible, maybe it's not. We see here that the gifts take many forms and many functions, meaning, and this is very critical, meaning gifts do not equal role. Gifts do not equal role, meaning just because a person has the gift of teaching doesn't mean that they should be in any and all teaching positions in the church. Or if they have the gift of leadership, that doesn't mean they should be automatically leading a church. There are a variety of gifts, and in that variety, there's varieties of services and a variety of activities. It's a beautiful mosaic, the way that God has ordered and structured his church. The question you have to be asking yourself right now is where and how are you using your gifts? What piece do you play in this beautiful mosaic of a church? Because if you are a Christian, you have a gift and it's meant to be used. And this last point here is probably, I would hope it's self-evident. But the gifts are empowered by God in each person. For all the, for all the diversity and the array of gifts— what they have in common is that God is the one who empowers them each and every single person. This is critically important. We are always to rely on the strength of God as a church. Woe to the church and woe to the pastor who thinks they do anything out of their own strength. It is the Holy Spirit. It is God who empowers his church. You don't want a church built on my back. So before we talk about the specific gifts, I think we need to highlight this really important transitional verse here. Verse 7, if you have your Bibles open. He says, To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Two things we need to pick up here. The manifestation of the Spirit. In Scripture, the word manifestation simply means to be brought into the light or to be seen. So what we need to understand, what Paul is saying here is that if you want to see the unseen spirit. If you want to see the Holy Spirit, then look to a church that's empowered with his gifts and are using those gifts. That's the manifestation of the Spirit. 
And then he says, but it's for the common good. This is an interesting phrase uh, in the original language. It has this idea of like, yes, common good, but it's like this mutual upbuilding. What Paul is telling us here, that these gifts are not meant for your sole personal benefits. The gifts are meant to be used so that everyone profits. And yes, you will be benefited too by your own gifts, but it's not just for you. Your gift is to be used in the larger context of the church. More on that in the coming weeks as we look at some of the other gifts that Paul mentions later in this passage. So what are the gifts? As we already said, no list in the Bible that is given is exhaustive. And even when we put the four lists together, I don't think that's exhaustive. So let's talk about the ones that he does mention here in these verses that we're looking at today. He mentions nine. First, wisdom and knowledge. Now, these two are similar in language. Paul talks about the utterance of wisdom and the utterance of knowledge. The, dis- the distinction here between these two isn't super clear, but what they do have in common is, is the word utterance. Or in the original language, it's simply the word logos, which we talked about a few weeks ago if you were with us, which is the very simple, basic word, word. So it's very probable that wisdom and knowledge are different ways to talk about a special quote-unquote word that God has given his people to speak to one another. Again, for the building up of believers, for the building up of the church. And maybe this is through mentoring or discipleship or teaching. The next thing that Paul mentions is faith. Faith. Now listen here. Paul's not referring to saving faith, a faith that every Christian has in the risen Jesus. He's referring to a special spiritual fortitude of faith that brings edification to fellow believers. So let me ask you real quick. Do you have someone, can you point to someone in your life whose faith really encourages you and inspires you? Does anyone have someone in your life like that? Let me see. Yeah. More than likely, that person that you have in your mind right now, they have the spiritual gift of faith. A special faith that just goes to like see the church built up and encourages other. I have those people in my life and I am very thankful for them. Now, as we get into this next set of gifts, uh, this is where we're going to find some healthy and sometimes not so healthy dialogue between well-meaning Christians. And so before we move on to this next set of gifts, I want to talk about an important belief that many people hold on to. It's the idea of cessationism. Cessationism. And, and, and those who would call themselves cessationists. Now, this comes from the word cease, to cease, which means to stop. A cessationist is someone who believes that the spiritual gifts have stopped, they have ceased, that they're no longer given by the Holy Spirit. And and normally, normally a cessationist is speaking specifically about the clearly miraculous gifts that we're going to talk about, like healings, miracles, prophecies, and tongues. Normally, the logic goes like this, that the more miraculous gifts were given to the early Christians, the first generations of Christians, as a a way to authenticate the the apostles and also to lay a foundation for the church, a a sort of jumpstart, if you will, for the first Christians. But, But because that first generation has passed away, because we no longer have the 12 apostles, we would, people who are cessationists would say, well, therefore, the gifts have stopped. The, the gifts of seeds. With the close of the first generation of Christians, we no longer have the miraculous gifts. Now, if you take someone who has that reasoning and you add to that how much the miraculous gifts have been absolutely abused by people, how tongues seem to go absolutely wild in certain settings, and how wolves in sheep's clothing have claimed to be healers, stealing millions from people who are desperate from a, for a miracle, you add all that and you add to the fact that they have no interaction with a true, truly biblical Christian who's using these gifts, well, it's easy to see why people would say, you know what, the miraculous gifts sound like a first century thing and they're no longer for us. I'm sympathetic to that. But with my cards on the table, the reason that I'm not a cessationist is not because I speak in tongues. I don't. It's not because I work miracles. Up until this point, I haven't. I'm not a cessationist because I don't see in the Bible 
where the Bible's closed the door on these gifts. Paul does say in the very next chapter, in chapter 13, he does say that tongues and knowledge and prophecy will cease. He does say that. But in that context, he's trying to bring contrast between the spiritual gifts and love. And he's talking about how love never ends. He says all these other things, these spiritual gifts, they will end, but love will never end. He's talking about that fact that love never ends. He's not trying to tell us when the spiritual gifts will end. So I believe in these gifts. I believe they still happen, not because I witness them all the time, but because I don't see a clear teaching in Scripture where they have stopped. What I do see in Scripture is a call for orderly worship. What I do see in Scripture is an an immense, beautiful, deep call for Christians to love each other. And I have spoken with people who I trust. I trust their witness, who have seen the miraculous happen. So let's talk about the miraculous gifts. Paul talks about the gifts of healing. Notice that the word gifts is plural. Just like the variety of gifts when it comes to healing, there's many ways this plays out. Like cancer. Those who have experienced the the miracle of healing, that medically is called spontaneous remission. This happens, and science has a term for it. Paul talks about the working of miracles. Now, when you, when you read this through, it just kind of sounds like in this passage here, Paul's just kind of further expounding on the notion of healings, but in a broader, more generic sense of just miracles. Paul doesn't specify here what he's exactly talking about, so I won't try to either, other than to say that the word that Paul's talking about here is dunamis. It's the word that we get our word for dynamite. It means power. Paul's talking about those, certain people have the power to work miracles. Miracles are those acts that are beyond the natural order. And then we have prophecy. Prophecy. It would be wrong. It would be wrong, period, to mean that this is someone speaking anything that's on par or above Scripture. Anyone claiming to have a prophetic word that's equal with Scripture or above Scripture, that person would be refuted and brought under discipline immediately. We thoroughly reject this. The New Testament has closed. God has spoken. It would also be wrong to talk about prophecy in the sense that you know the future. What prophecy means here is is, is a word that you can speak. That's, That's a timely word of truth to someone sold again that they might be built up. Maybe built up as in bringing them a caution about what is happening. Or telling them something they need to hear about what they're going through. Now, I have had times where a word of prophecy was given to me. And when we say word, I'll be honest with you, sometimes, actually almost, I don't want to say all the time, but a lot of the time when a word of prophecy is given to me, what what someone says is, "I I think I have something for you. I have this picture in my head. And they describe this picture. They don't know what it means, but they're telling me because I think they believe God wants them to tell me this. And they don't know what this picture means, but I, it becomes crystal clear for me. I've had this happen. Now, there, th- that's happened, and I believe that that's a word, quote-unquote, that empowered by the Spirit that I needed to hear. And I know people who I believe have the gift of prophecy, and this doesn't mean that they have a word for any and all occasions. It doesn't mean I go and check with them about what's happening to validate to make sure that God's doing this. This just means that they have a, that God's given them a gift for at certain times and for certain situations that the, that the Spirit empowers them to speak something that would build up another believer, something that may, they may need to hear. But when someone gives me a word like that, and if someone gives you a word like that, do not take it at face value. Pray over it. Employ the gift of discernment. Ask, ask the Lord if this is for you or not. This goes into what Paul talks about next. The ability to distinguish between spirits, a.k.a. discernment. To put it like this, discernment is when a person can tell when the Holy Spirit is behind something versus a misguided person, a person with bad motives, or a demonic force. This person can tell when the Holy Spirit is truly behind something. And I think this is a very important gift for those who are in leadership. 
to be able to tell when the Spirit is moving versus something else. Now these lead to our last two that Paul mentions in this passage and what probably invoked the most questions for people. Paul talks about various kinds of tongues and the interpretation of tongues. Now, I'm assuming a lot of people know automatically what I'm talking about, but let's just talk about for those who, who may not understand what we're talking about here. Tongues here, when the Bible speaks of tongues, it's referring to a language other than the one that you know. Like you speak a language that you don't know. Or some, you hear someone speaking a language that they clearly don't know. But the question becomes, what language are they speaking? And this is where you get to, to some, some discussion and some debate. It really boils down to two different approaches to this. And um, because theologians have nothing better to do, they give us big weird terms. So the two notions here are xenoglossia and glossolalia. Let's talk about the difference between these two. Xenoglossia means speaking in an unlearned human language. That means that at a certain time, you, you're, you're an English speaker, you don't know Chinese, someone's speaking Chinese, the, the Holy Spirit empowers you to be able to speak Chinese to that person so that they may be built up in the gospel. That is xenoglossia. Now that's, that's the miracle that we see in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit descends on those disciples and they walk outside into Jerusalem during Pentecost. The city's booming because people are there celebrating and all these disciples start speaking all these different languages. Some people think they're just crazy or drunk, but then some people are from foreign lands. They come and hear these people speaking. They're like, whoa, 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 they're not drunk. They're speaking in my language. That's xenoglossia, speaking in an unlearned human language. The other is glossolalia. Now, this is speaking in an unknown language, like a heavenly language that the angels speak, or a personal prayer language that the Spirit has granted to a person. As far as which one Paul is referring to, I'm going to say this. This is difficult to answer. It's not easy to answer. Some may think it is based on certain experiences or desires that people have, but I want to share with you what D.A. Carson said. He is one of the most brilliant theologians of our time. Even he was confused on this passage. He says this, quote, This is an extraordinarily difficult question to answer, speaking of which gift Paul is referring to, or which tongue Paul is referring to. This is an extraordinarily difficult question to answer convincingly on either side, despite dogmatic claims by many proponents on each side. In fact, Paul takes this matter so seriously, he spends all of chapter 14 talking about prophecy and tongues. So, in our Bible's context, he's writing to a church, right? He's writing to the Corinthians. What had presumably been happening, presumably been happening, was that the gifts of tongues were being used without proper discernment, without order, without interpretation. They were just running amok and causing confusion among that church. And Paul, in his attempt to answer their question, notice he doesn't refute the practice, but he does try to funnel it. Paul talks about the spiritual gifts. Here's the arc of the passages that we're looking at. In chapter 12, Paul introduces the concept of spiritual gifts, giving us a broad overview. Then in chapter 13, one of the most famous chapters in all the Bible, if you've ever been to a wedding, you've heard this read. That's the great love chapter. Love is patient. Love is kind. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am a resounding gong. So chapter 12, he introduces the gifts. Chapter 12, he gives us one of the most beautiful discourses on love the world has ever known. And then in chapter 14, he gets into the nitty-gritty about prophecy and specifically tongues. It's almost like Paul is saying, I know there's confusion. I know people are, are it's, it, there's not order. But listen, if you're a Christian, the primary thing you have for one another is love. Beyond all else. Gifts will come, they will go, but love will remain forever. Okay, now let's talk about tongues. And so, he goes through chapter 14 talking about tongues and prophecy, but then he, he closes his great three-chapter discourse on the spiritual gifts with this passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40. He says, but all things should be done decently and in order. So with all things being done in love and decently, 
Let's talk about the gift of tongues and their partner interpretation. So here's where we biblically stand. We believe in tongues. But while we believe they may be operational, we do not believe they are called to be normative, meaning we don't think they need to happen in every setting that every time in Christian, that Christians gather by every Christian. Paul says in chapter 14, verse 39, he says, desire prophecy, but do not forbid speaking in tongues. But there are many people who think, many Christians, many sects of Christians, who think that tongues is proof that you are a Christian. And if you don't speak in tongues, then you're not a Christian. We do not believe that. In fact, I think, the, I would dare say the Bible is pretty clear on that. Paul says, to another is given the gift of prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongue, to another their interpretation of tongues. I don't see Paul saying that everyone has to speak in tongues. So what is the place and practice of the gift of tongues? Well, Paul has a lot to say about the gift of speaking in tongues. Again, it's all of chapter 14. But as you walk through chapter 14, and I hope that you do, let me give you some highlights about the place and practice of tongues. Number one, the driving force for tongues and all of the gifts is to see the church built up. That is the reason the gifts are given to Christians, so that the church may be built up. If you need a verse reference, I gave you plenty. You cannot be, listen to me, you cannot be desperate to see the gifts being used at Peace Church without also being equally zealous to see the church here at Peace built up. Paul gives a vision for a church. He talks about two different things. The Apostle Paul envisioned a church where A, Believers were being built up and worship was not disorderly. He's clearly trying to hammer this in because what was happening at Corinth was, was just running awry. He is just constantly weaving this, this, this idea through everything he's talking about. This, this, we're about building the church. This is not about disorder. But through this all, Paul is immensely concerned about, about non-believers coming into this context He's really concerned about the experience they're going to have when, he walk, when they walk into a church like what was happening at Corinth. And he, he's very concerned. Paul's vision for a church is where non-believers were being blessed with truth, not confused by tongues. If you are not a believer in Jesus Christ and you're here, number one, thank you for being here. I love the fact that you're here. I pray that the truth we present changes your life if you have the heart to receive it. Paul's envision for the church is the church was built up. Worship was not disorderly. He, uh, he wanted non-believers blessed with truth, not confused by the tongues. Paul is saying here, that there's no point speaking if people don't understand what you're saying. He's trying, but in this, in this though, he's trying to save the gift of tongues while turning down the, the fanaticism around it. He wants to make sure that the church is built up and that outsiders aren't put off. That's what, that's what Paul wants to see happen. So how and where are tongues to be used? Well, as, as Paul describes, um, tongues are to be used among gathered Christians accompanied by interpretation and discernment. I have a church planting friend of mine who planted a church this past fall. And in the first month of planting a church, they were doing a worship service. And in the middle of the worship service, a person stood up and started speaking in tongues. A church plants normally aren't very big, so it's a smaller group. And there, it, you could tell like, people, people were a little unsure of what was going on here. And so my friend, because he's a biblical preacher and he, um, he's a strong leader, he rightly said, okay, uh, do we have an interpretation? He called for someone to give an interpretation. Well, this person's spouse stood up and said, I have the interpretation. Now, I I don't want, I'm not trying to sound judgmental, I'm not trying to be so judgmental, but but that's highly sus. (laughs) My friend, um, has the gift of discernment, and he told me that flags were going all off in his spirit. Flags were being raised all over in his spirit. So because he's a great leader, he took 
he was cool, calm, and collected. He explained to the church that gifts like this are to be used to build the church, not send it into confusion. And he asked for this couple to step aside so that he could have a conversation with them and allow worship to continue. I thought he did it in a very gracious, honorable way. So here's what I'd say to you, Peace Church. We do not want to keep the Holy Spirit in a box. But we do want to keep our church within the boundaries of the Bible. Honestly, I was hoping for a little bit more amens than that, but that's okay. (laughs) Paul's clear. Chapter 14, verse 19, he says, Paul says, he would rather speak five intelligible words than 10,000 words in tongues. He calls for the gathering of the church to be a place for the upbuilding for both believers and non-believers. He says that tongues is something that can cause disorder and confusion. But he's so interesting when he talks about it. Because he talks about all this caution. But on the flip side, he says, I speak in tongues more than anybody else. And he even says at one point, I hope you all speak in tongues. But he wants it done in order and to see the church built up because of it. So Paul seemingly does allow, but he does not mandate the use of tongues when the church is gathered. And honestly, I would be very, very, very surprised if God called a member of our congregation to interrupt the service to speak in tongues. Because I just don't believe at this time it would be a positive for our church. Knowing how fast our church is growing and with how many people are checking us out and how many new believers there are and young believers and non-believers, I just don't think that's what God would call for us to, to experience right now. But if that did happen, I would do exactly what my friend did. If someone stood up and started speaking in tongues, I would call for an interpretation. I would call for the people who have the gift of discernment to validate what was happening. I'd call on our elders to ensure that what was happening was within order to Scripture. I'd also use my own gift of discernment in the matter. So church, hear me. Please hear me on this. I am not saying any of this to try to subdue the Spirit. I'm trying to be faithful to the text that is before us. I absolutely pray on my knees through sweat and tears for an outpouring of the Spirit upon this church, upon the families who call this church home, I want to see that happen. I want to see this happen because I have given my life to see the church of Jesus Christ built up. But I want to see it built up rightly, in truth, in faith, in love, and in power. Now, in similar, um, now now in smaller settings, what happens when a tongue is spoken in a group setting? Again, there should be a call for an interpretation and for the use of discernment. But what about a personal prayer language? Not something meant for interpretation, not something that's meant for the larger group, but just in a group prayer, someone's praying a personal prayer language, and they're clearly speaking in tongues. Now, I have been in settings with faithful Bible-believing Christians in a, in a prayer group, and someone's praying, and you can hear someone else in the group. They're not praying out loud. They're praying, to themselves. They're praying in a language that's clearly not a known human language. What about them? What about those faithful Christians? I would say there's probably a few of you, if not more, in here. What I would say is that I don't see a clear teaching in Scripture about this, and I also don't see a prohibition. Now, there are many ways to look at this, but ultimately what I see is I see Scripture paint a beautiful picture that leaves space for charity among Christians in the way that we engage the Spirit. I do see boundaries, but I also see space for charity. I think there's enough room for Christians to have charitable differences in understanding about this. But what I do see crystal clear, a resounding call, is for Christians to have a deep, profound, standard-setting love for one another, even despite our differences and disruptions. So let's end by going back to the beginning. The spiritual gifts are a critical way the Holy Spirit empowers you to be a part of the good work that he is doing at peace. The spiritual gifts are the way that the Spirit is manifest. It's the evidence that he's working among us. Church, let me ask you, do you want to see the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, do you want to see him do a great work at peace, church? Church.
Some of you said that with a question mark. So I'm looking for a definitive answer. Do you want to see the Spirit move and work at Peace Church? Amen. So let's stand up and let's worship and allow him to lead us now. As you stand up, let's pray. Lord of heaven and earth, by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, we pray that you, Holy Spirit, would be our ultimate worship leader right now. That you'd be made manifest in the way that we love and serve each other. Would you come here and now as we pray all this in the name of Jesus, seeing the evidence of your goodness in our lives and in our church. Lord, we love you and we pray these things in the power of the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.